Alfredo Toro Hardy is one of the most distinguished diplomat scholars that I've the pleasure of knowing. He has served his country, Venezuela, <clears throat> with great distinction as a diplomat. Prior to coming to Singapore, he had served as ambassador to the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Spain, uh, Ireland, and Chile, and Chile. <laughs> uh, um, but he, he leads two lives, the life of a diplomat and the life of a scholar. Um, he had published 18 books and had co-authored 13 more. So I aspire to emulate him, but I haven't quite achieved his number. Um, he had taught at many prestigious universities in the United States, in Europe, in Venezuela and other parts of the world. So Ambassador Toro Hadi is a very distinguished man. I would describe him as knowledgeable and thoughtful and very cultured. It's been a great pleasure for Singapore to have had you, Alfredo, as Ambassador of Venezuela. Thank and you thank you for your contributions. I was very honoured when uh, Alfredo asked whether I could contribute one of the two forwards to the book. The other forward was contributed by the rector of the UN University of Peace, uh, a very good forward. I wanted to give a sort of Asian perspective. So I want to tell you that um, in 1998, my then Prime Minister, Mr. Go Chok Tong, was to, about to visit Chile, and he convened a few of us um, to brainstorm on what he could say in the lecture that he was going to deliver in, in Chile, in Santiago. And uh, some of us said, you know, if you look at the world and the dynamic regions of the world, there is a missing link. And this missing link is between Latin America and East Asia. So when he was in Santiago, he delivered a lecture in which he proposed that we should fill this missing link. And this was the reason which gave birth in the following year, 1999, to FILA. It's based upon, in my view, a correct vision, which is to bring about a connection and convergence between these two dynamic regions. Um, it hasn't quite lived up to our expectations, um, but <coughs> the vision remained valid, and I continue to believe in it. Latin America, to most Asians, is a very romantic, but far away region. Distance separates us. Language also separates us. Because apart from the English-speaking Caribbean, uh, the Latin American people speak either Spanish, or in the case of Brazil, Portuguese. And not many Asians are able to speak either Spanish or Portuguese. I acknowledge, of course, that the elite in Latin America are all English-speaking. But nevertheless, on the street, if you don't speak Spanish, um, Portuguese, you are disadvantaged. But the greatest distance between our two regions is not geography, it is not language, but it is culture. In order for Asians to do business successfully in Latin America, we need to be, more, to be better informed and to be more knowledgeable about the history, the heritage, and the culture of these countries and peoples. Latin America is a very vast region, and although I've traveled to many countries in this continent, um, geographically, I would say, I would um, divide this region into four component parts. You have North America, and, and Mexico is part of North America. You have Central America, and I've been to two Central American countries, Panama and Costa Rica, and then you have South America. Then you also have the Caribbean region. In South America, you are, have a linguistic divide between the Portuguese-speaking Brazilian and the Spanish-speaking country. We cannot, we, cannot, um, we cannot know Mexico and then assume that Latin America is Mexico writ large. It is not. Yeah. Every country is unique and different. It is the result of its history, its interactions with the indigenous people, its connections with the outside world. And uh, the small quarrel I wanted to pick with you, Alfredo, is that in your concluding chapter of the book, 
you situate Latin America as part of the Western civilization. Yeah? Uh, I would respectfully disagree. I think, <laughs> I think Latin, Amer Latin America um, is a civilization unto itself. It is, of course, there are many commonalities between Latin America and the Western civilization, but when I'm in Latin America, I don't feel that I'm in America or in Europe. I feel that I'm in a different civilization, you know. So that's the one small quarrel with him. I'm very grateful to you for writing this, for writing this book. Because as the interests increase in our private sectors in Asia, um, to do business in Latin America, we need a guide. We need some guru like Alfredo to synthesize for us in a very reader-friendly and accessible manner a synthesis of the history culture and heritage of these countries and people. And I think you've done that admirably. So it is with very great pleasure that I now call on the Guru himself to say a few words to us. Alfredo, please. I will speak about the subject of the book. Essentially, what is Latin America all about? I'll have to read a bit, a bit because the subject is a bit complex, so please bear with me. Booming volumes of trade, foreign direct investments, and loans prove the thriving nature of the economic relation between Asia and Latin America. However, Latin knowledge about Latin America is surprisingly scarce. Profoundly involved in an economic relation, yet with unfamiliar partners, Asian find themselves in manifest disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis North Americans or Europeans when dealing with Latin Americans. Unlike the very old, centuries old and cemented relation of the United States or Europe with the region, Asians are newcomers, insufficiently knowledgeable newcomers. There would seem to be thus an empirical relation between the amount of business existing between our two regions and the limited grasp that Asians have of their Latin American content. Understanding Latin American attitudes, meanings, and behavioral differences becomes thus a necessity for Asians to overcome this competitive disadvantage they are with when dealing with Latin America. Latin America is made up of those non-Anglo or Dutch components of the Americas formed in the common molds of the Catholic religion, the Latin, the Latin cultural heritage, and Romance languages. Iberian America and Haiti would naturally fit into this description. The former because of its Spanish and Portuguese ancestry, the latter because of its French one. However, if we, were, if we were to take this argument to its logical conclusion, we'll have to include as well uh, within the notion of Latin America not only the Catholic and French-speaking province of Quebec in Canada, but also France itself by virtue of its overseas territories in the Americas. Nevertheless, when the term Latin America is used, its meaning is more restricted, as it just covers the Iberian American country, that is, Brazil and the 19 uh, Hispanic American nations. Why then the term Latin America? The notion of Latin America originated in France at the time when the French emperor Napoleon III held hegemonic aspirations at the other side of the Atlantic, particularly in Mexico. To provide a framework of legitimacy to this aspiration, he needed to underline a common link between his country and that part of the world. The so-called Pan-Latin Pan thesis, which amalgamated within a common identity the countries located on both shores of the Atlantic that could uh, traced back their origin to ancient Rome, became the obvious solution. Despite France's retreat from Mexico in 1866 and the fall of Napoleon III on Empire in 1870, 
the notion persisted in the region. It is quite surprising that a term that was born with imperialistic designs survived and was accepted. For their own reasons, though, Latin American elites, regional elites, found the term conveniently, conveniently useful for their own purposes and adopted it at, as the new symbol of the region. At the end of the era of Napoleon III coincided with the emergence all over the Iberian American countries of a powerful positivist movement which saw France as the epitome of civilization. Both Brazil and Spanish America found it convenient to call themselves by the name that enhanced their connection, their kinship to France. In Hispanic America, this move had a further motive, to establish a direct parentage with the Western civilization skirting round Spain. As a result, the region came to be known as Latin America, obviating a more descriptive notion of its origins. Nonetheless, as I've mentioned, when we talk about Latin America, we are essentially referring to Iberian America. The notion of Iberian America itself comprises those countries of the Americas which were former colonies of Spain, of Spain and Portugal, and where Spanish or Portuguese are spoken. The prefix Iberian derives from the fact that those two European countries share the Iberian Peninsula, located in the foremost western part of that continent. Both Spain and Portugal share an old, rich, and complex civilization. This civilization was a result of many centuries of physical coexistence and fusion of cultures among Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and before them, of the interaction with many other civilizations. Spain and Portugal were part of the same Roman province, Hispania, and could have evolved as a single state if events in the 10th and 11th century had not decided otherwise. Probably, no other two countries in Europe are as similar as these two are. Starting with these joint denominators, Spaniards and Portuguese, which have to go through the same process of racial mixture and cultural fusion when they reached the new world, giving rise to a human group of similar characteristics. In the process, the indigenous civilizations and people whom they encounter were confronted to the same chattering experiences, defeat, submission, servitude, conversion to their overlords, overlords religion and massive human losses resulting from the infectious disease brought up by the Iberians. The demographic crumbling of the Indians as a consequence of the lack of resistance to alien illnesses generated a lack of workforce. This led to the introduction in the Americas of its third human protagonist, the African slave. If the fate of the Indian had been dramatic, that of the African slave was by no means better. The human identity of Iberian America would thus be the result of the miscegenation and acculturation of these three groups, the Iberian, the Indian, and the African slave. Notwithstanding this fusion, the Iberians were the prevalent force imposing, imposing upon the rest language, religion, law, architecture, and hegemonic ideas. Moreover, those members of the social structure which preserved their whiteness through inbreeding became for a long time its leading sector. These similarities aside, however, there are relevant differences between Brazil and Spanish America. To begin with, because of the more pragmatic and conciliatory character of the Brazilians when compared 
to Hispanic Americans. The history of Brazil displays a process of moderate evolution the void of the epic deeds and sudden shocks so typical of Hispanic America. It has been correctly said that the Brazilians fell asleep one night as a colony and woke up to find themselves an independent empire, and some time later woke up again to find themselves a republic. The history of Hispanic America, on the other hand, looks more grandiose and much more traumatic. In Brazil, conditions were created for the colony to become a unitary state after independence from Portugal. The opposite happened in Hispanic American colonies. The soil was, pub, was paid for its fracture into numerous countries after its liberation. Moreover, prevailing conditions in Brazil allow the country to emerge as an independent monarchy with a prince of Portugal, Portuguese royal blood in the throne. Conversely, Spanish America underwent harrowing and bloody wars of independence against the Spanish monarch, which led to a republican system and a more conflicted view of its colonial past. Brazil monarchical regime provided power legitimacy and allowed for the arbitration of conflicted, conflicting interest ambitions. Independent Hispanic American nations, on the other hand, were faced to the beheading of the established order uh, and to profound institutional disorientation. Moreover, civil wars plagued the Spanish America after independence as conflicted social and societal interest ambitions could not be reconciled. As Brazil became a republic at the end of the 19th century, it entered into greater political tune with Hispanic American nations, with which it shared similar challenge. A curious form of synchronism with many of these nations materialized with an pendulum movement that alternated between democratic and military governments. Even though Brazil has always shown a more moderate and pragmatic evolution than its Hispanic American cousins. There are thus commonalities and differences between Brazilian and Hispanic Americans. A natural convergence arises from, the, from what they have in common, while the ways in which they are different constructively complements them. All that being said, Brazil and Spanish America share a common destiny and a strong sense of solidarity. But what about Hispanic America itself? Are they, are they sufficient common denominators within it to use the singular when referring to Hispanic America? Spanish America, as it is to be expected, shows elements of homogeneity and heterogeneity. Many homogeneous elements are present within this group of nations. There is a common language, which implies possessing the most powerful instrument for the transmission of the cultural identity. There is a shared religion, which represents not only an attachment to the same spiritual values, but also similar cultural expressions of that faith. There is a synchronism of historical events which projects itself to a common path beyond the ocean and to share experiences once in the Americas. The latter covers a period of 500 years where the political processes move in cyclical waves. There are also shared social values which revolve around the family as a fundamental building block of society. But beyond the commonalities, Hispanic Americans also show difference. Two of them <coughs> turn out to be of particular relevance. The first are those which derive from the variety of latitudes, topography, and climate. The second one emerges from the diverse racial mixtures or the lack of it, or from the lack of it. Hispanic America is a wide and diverse region. 
Its countries coexist within different geographical contexts, which translates into dissimilar attitudinal characteristics. But, uh, but together with geography, we also find ethnicity and, by extension, by extension cultural identity. As the three, the three original human components of Hispanic, of Hispanic America brought with them different cultural traits, it is logical to assume that a mixture or lack of it produced different outcomes. The indigenous and black elements of society that mixed with the Spanish one were highly heterogeneous in nature. Not only the indigenous populations were extremely diverse, but also the black ethnicity derived from a wide range of sources. Consequently, while the Spanish ethnicity played a centripetal role being the glue that held the whole together, the Indian and African elements played a centrifugal role. But in addition to such centrifugal forces in play, Hispanic America can be divided in three basic areas according to their ethnicity. There is a Spanish America of a strong indigenous roots, another one of important African ones, and finally one mostly, mostly white, each showing a distinct personality. The diverse countries of the region give different connotations to the phenomenon of miscegenation. Some looked at it favorably and give proper recognition to its ethnicity diversity, while others, nowadays the minority, see it with pejorative eyes. Notwithstanding the difference amid Hispanic Americans, the sure elements clearly prevail. The solidarity shown between the different countries is rarely seen in other parts of the world. With such a complex background and characteristics, we must ask ourselves, can Iberian American Iberian Americans claim to be part of Western civilization, and this is where Tommy and I disagree. The answer certainly is not clear cut. To begin with, some scholars sustain that Spaniards and Portuguese are not properly Westerners, besides having been conquered by the Moors by for many centuries. Arguments in that direction insist that the two movements which were responsible for some of the essential features of Western thought, meaning the Renaissance and the 18th century Enlightenment, scarcely reached Spain and Portugal. According to Mexican intellectual Carlos Fuentes, the Iberian Peninsula remained eccentric, that is, far from the center, in relation to the nucleus of Western civilization as symbolized, for instance, by countries such as, as France or England. Hence, the starting point of Latin American cultural heritage is a fringe model, as both Spain and Portugal were eccentric, eccentric countries. But then, upon their arrival to the Americans, Iberians did not conform a settler society as the English did in North America, Australia, or New Zealand. Much the country, as mentioned before, they mix themselves with indigenous and African elements, giving rise to an acculturated society. In other words, Latin America represents a, a sort of fringe version of the Iberian fringe model itself. Not surprisingly, then, Latin Americans have uh, so many doubts in relation to their own identity. These doubts have led to a soul-searching attitude, particularly among Hispanic Americans, that has permeated several schools of thought. In order to properly assess the inclusion of Latin American Western civilization, though, some background is needed. Western civilization was the result of the interweaving between the classical tradition, meaning Greek and Roman, and the Judeo-Christian world. Other elements were added to this mix, particularly 
brain a sense as enlightenment, as mentioned before. But the previous two, classical tradition and Judeo-Christian world, were the central elements. What entitlement, entitlement then have Latin Americans to such heritage? Colonization was a process of incorporation into Western values. Either in America, inherited such values, state, family, home, urbanization, social relation, the situation of women and children, property, crime and punishment, etc., were concepts directly deriving from Roman law and the Catholic Church. For five centuries, with a few localized exceptions, Iberian Americans were subject to an overwhelmingly predominant Western culture. However, Latin Americans have a particular way of being Westerners, and this would be my reply to Tommy. This, as mentioned, is an acculturated society in which powerful identity influences move in every direction. Not all of its three original components, though, contributed in equal measure to the final product. As said, the Iberians remain as the undisputed guiding force within the mix determining its fundamental characteristics. In other words, a Roman Christian heritage was the central element. As such, Latin Americans have sufficient titles to be included within Western civilization. However, they are in the periphery of this civilization, as there are clearly Roman Christian set of values coexist, sometimes peacefully, sometimes wistfully, and even belligerently with the values of its, of its other cultural identity. This allows them to look at Western civilization from within and from without. In other words, they can be at once entitled to and highly critical of Western civilization. A very intriguing position to be indeed. Latin America, a peripheral Western region, shares nonetheless the same hemisphere with the United States, a country that epitomizes today the Western world. The astonishing development attained by the Anglo-Saxon society of the North and the continuous but unfulfilled quest towards development by the Latin societies of the South are immersed in profound cultural difference. Why was one so successful while the other one mirrored in so many problems and limitations? Even if this great dichotomy took shape after independence, the defining cultural reasons behind it were forged during the respective colonial periods. Both began as overseas colonies of European countries. Both were amply endowed with natural resources. Both achieved their independence during the so-called age of revolutions in the late 18th and beginning of the 19th century. And in the case of the United States and Spanish America, revolutionary wars were needed to consolidate separation from the respective metropolis. But here, similarities disappear. Endless rules, norms, and regulations within a bureaucratic and legalistic environment define the Iberian metropolitan relations with their colonies. In contrast, English colonies in North America enjoyed of wide political autonomy. Trade regulations imposed by Madrid and Lisbon work against the development of intercolonial trade and the creation of a network of ports across the region, transporting the colonies bullion, billion uh, and agricultural products to the metropolis was the only interest of such capital. British North America, on the other hand, not only promoted the creation of numerous ports, but allow each to compete for trade. This not only provided invaluable commercial experience, but led them to an economic specialization that seeded the soil for industrialization. 
Preventing intellectual inquisitiveness and religious and moral deviation was the main role of the colonial church, colonial church in Iberian America. Church and state work in tandem with the Inquisition being is an action to both. In the Anglo-Saxon North, on the other way, competition to attract colonists implied the existence of a broad spectrum of religious denominations were to choose from. In fact, English, English colonization arose from the search of religious freedom. Iberian American, essentially urban societies, were highly stratified in nature. They dwarf, by comparison, the European class system. North American colonists, on the other hand, not only want to leave behind the English class system, but being in the majority Protestants were a homogenized population. Moreover, theirs was an essentially rural environment in which manual labor prevailed, leaving thus little room for social distinction. A very American conquerors wanted to be Hidalgos, that is, gentry. That meant not having to work, but making others work for them. It meant obtaining glory at war so as to be rewarded with the land and workforce. North American Protestants were austere, industrious, and disciplined. Moreover, Calvinists, Lutherans, and Baptists believed in predestination, in that nothing could change what was preordained. Material success was interpreted, though, as a sign of divine, divine favor and hence of eternal salvation. Consequently, there was a compulsive pursuit of material success that was integral to their own identity. Not surprisingly, United States and Iberian America evolved in different directions. Political institutions, economic development, freedom of thought, intellectual inquisitiveness, democratic spaces, and work ethic in both took different routes. The asymmetric evolution of these two spheres produced an asymmetric relation as well. Such relation was formed by well-defined chapters. Initially, the United States promulgated a sphere of influence in the hemisphere that foreclosed any further European penetration. This perimeter was defined by the so-called Monroe Doctrine. Another chapter of this saga was the so-called Manifest Destiny, which defined the US continental expansion ambitions. During this period, the United States took from Mexico half of its territory, what nowadays are the states of California, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and by other means also Texas. After the successful war with Spain in 1898, the United States entered into a new chart, empire. empire. During this phase, Puerto Rico became an American colony Cuba a protectorate, and Panama was separated from Colombia and transformed into another protectorate with its canal zone failing under American legal jurisdiction. U.S. troops invaded countries from the Caribbean basin in 34 occasions, occupying some of them for extended periods of time. And suddenly, a new phase arrived with the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt the so-called good neighborhood chapter, a policy of absolute non-intervention in Latin American affairs was put in place, while Washington tolerated a wide degree of political and economic autonomy in the region. This included, among other things, nationalization of oil in Mexico. Respect for the governments prevailed in what became the best moment in the relations between both parties. The following chapter, Cold War, was a ghastly one. Under the spell of ideological demons and seeing the threat of communists at every corner, Washington was instrumental 
in promoting human rights violating dictatorships through the region. In the middle of this extremely difficult time, the parentheses represented by Jimmy Carter became a breeze of fresh air for Latin America. Trade and drugs was the subsequent chapter as those two issues absorbed the attention of the U.S. towards Latin America. This phase, which arrived with the collapse of communism, was to be followed until the Obama administration. President Trump seems to be opening a new chapter, the controls of which are yet in the making. The drifting apart between the U.S. and Latin America, a trend that began materializing during the trade and drug period, were probably consolidated during the current administration. The U.S. closest partners in the region seem indeed to be in the loose inside of the political and economic equation introduced by Trump. During the major part of their independent history, relations between the United States and Latin America seems to be guided by a Thucydides quote in the Malian Dialogue, according to which the powerful do what they want while the weak endure what they must. Approaching the second decade of the fresh millennium, though, things have changed. While the United States and Latin America are increasingly drifting apart, the influence, the influence of Washington upon the region is decreasing with every passing year. Curiously enough, the U.S. is following an opposite route with its society become more and more Latino American. By 2050, the total US population is projected to grow to almost 400 million, of which 28%, or about 112 million, will be Latinos. In other words, close to a third of its population will trace back their ascendancy to Iberian America. Nowadays, Latino figures are everywhere in mainstream America. But besides famous or well-reputed names, the argument of numbers is even more compelling. With more than 56 million people representing almost 80% of the total population, Latinos are the largest minority of that country. They are not only progressively more influential, but they, but they represent a fundamental electoral force. Being a fairly young population, its voting numbers will keep increasing with every passing election. In 2016, 20, more than 27 million Latinos, representing 12% of all eligible voters, were able to cast their ballots. By 2030, such a number will increase to 40 million. It must be outlined that more than 90% of Latinos under the age of 18 were born in the U.S. and are therefore entitled to vote. The numbers, though, just tell half of the story. Its block power tells the other half. In contrast to other national communities, as, for instance, German Americans or Norwegian Americans, which are diluted into mainstream America to the point of not being easy to target or mobilize, Latinos tend to act and react as a bloc. This increases substantially its political impact. The US influence in Latin America has been thus decreasing while they too have drifted apart. Meanwhile, since the millennium, China has been able to acquire a privileged standing in the region, becoming the main trade partner and lender of any of its countries. This requires some background, especially so because as late as the 1990s, China was totally absent from Latin America, whereas the US saw it as its backyard. Let's go back in time to properly frame the situation. Since independence, Latin American economies rely in the production and export of commodities and in the import of manufacturers from Europe and the United States. The successive dis disruptions in the access to foreign manufacturers brought up by World War I 
the Great Depression of the 1930s and World War II convinced Latin Americans about the need to create their own industrial base. This process, which began uh, uh, during the Second World War, but which was conceptualized in the later part of the 40s, of the 1940s, showed two greater flaws. The first was to visualize this process of substitution of imported goods as permanent in time. In doing so, they did not proceed as major developed economies had done. That is, using its intervention in policies to promote industrialization and protect national companies until they were prepared to compete internationally. Much the country, their industries were indefinitely isolated from the international from international competition. This implied creating a gap between highly competitive companies abroad and highly protected ones inside. The second flaw was that the dependency on the export of commodities remained. Indeed, while local manufacturers were sold inside a protected trade area, commodities were sold abroad. Hence, they kept being the fundamental source of foreign currency. Notwithstanding its flaws, the system provided excellent results. The success of the model based on the Keynesian doctrine mirrored the unprecedented prosperity that these policies brought to the Western world between 1945 and 1975. However, between 1950 and 1973, Latin America grew even faster than the world average, 5.4% versus 4.9%. However, the inherent vulnerabilities within this industrialization model were ready to concatenate when the right set of international circumstances appeared, and they did so as a result of the debt crisis. It all began during the 1970s, when an international banking system overflowed with petrodollars resulting from the starting hike of oil prices that brought it itself to grant plentiful loans. This easy access to international credits was seen by Latin American governments as an excellent opportunity to invest in infrastructure and the modernization of the state industries. As a result, the region got massively indebted under the, assumption, under the assumption prescribed by the conventional wisdom of the day that the interest rates would remain low for the foreseeable future. But they did not. In 1980, fighting its own problem of inflation, the U.S. initiated interest rates increase that climbed to over 22%. These rates spill over to loans to Latin America. This hit Latin America very hard. And between 1975 and 1982, the regional debt jumped from 45 billion US dollars to 333 billion. But at the same time that interest rates were hiking, the price of commodities was rapidly coming down. This situation of extreme weakness was compounded by the appearance of a new economic paradigm, neoliberalism. Just when Latin American governments were in need to refinance their debts, they were confronted to this ideological jargon. With its negotiating leverage collapse, the region had no other option but to bow to the so-called Washington Consensus. All of the above forced Latin American economists to a sudden and widespread opening of its trade barriers. This imposed upon a, upon a totally unprepared industrial sector the need to compete with the most efficient companies of the world. It was the equivalent to the brutal throwing down of the gates uh, of the walls of the citadel to let Genghis Khan hordes. In companies that had thrived under the old system, 
began to be slaughtered in mass. Through the so-called enterprise of the American initiative, George Bush Sr. provided the region with a meager lifesaver. Indeed, by transforming themselves into labor-intensive manufacturing producers within a subsidiary role to the American economy, Latin American countries could be able to retain manufacturing capability. Mexico, Dominican Republic, and the Central American nation reconverted their economies in order to play such a role. The rest of the region on the country essentially went back in time to the commodities era. This is Latin America, and here you see uh, Mexico, Central American countries, Dominican Republic became uh, uh, developed a subsidiary role in relation to the U.S. as providers of low-cost manufacturers, well, the rest of uh, Latin America, which includes Cuba and South America, emphasize commodities. Of course, Brazil always remained an important industrial uh, country, but uh, commodities were the fundamental part of, the, of its exports. And then, out of the blue, the millennium brought with it the arrival of China and the avalanche of uh, Chinese low-cost products. These had a dual effect on the region. Mexico and the other labor-intensive manufacturing economies were badly hit as a result of China's competition in the main export market. The, US. the rest of the region, though, benefited greatly as this Asian country was a voracious consumer of commodities. Thanks to this voraciousness, many Latin American economies began booming. In the decade between 2003 and 2013, trade between China and Latin America increased at a 27% uh, a year, rising to 200 and $89 billion in 2013. In other words, in scarcely 14 years, bilateral trade between China and Latin America multiplied more than 35 times. Of course, commodities producing countries were the main beneficiaries of this process. China also played a leading role in foreign direct investments in Latin America, essentially in commodities producing economies. Just between 2010 and the end of 2014, such investments accounted for 106 billion US dollars. Chinese loans to Latin America, to Latin America were equally significant, totally more than 130 billion dollars up to 2013. Since 2013, though, the commodities boom ceased. Several factors have triggered such downfall in the prices. But the common denominator has been the slowing down of the insatiable demand for natural resources in China. China's rebalancing towards domestic consumption means that industry grows less rapidly than in the past, while the service sectors expand. This generates a positioning away from commodity heavy sectors. Latin American producing commodities producers felt the pain. What are then the region's economic options? Latin American countries are in a typical middle income trap situation. Indeed, their economies are unable to compete with advanced economics, economies in high skill innovation. Only Brazil shows some endogenous high tech manufacturing niches, but still insufficient to be really meaningful. Conversely, as Latin American wages rise and its competitiveness declines, possibilities at the bottom side of the manufacturing equation are becoming ex increasingly difficult. Not even China's construction in labor-intensive manufacturing represents the solution, as all the Asian economies have taken its place at the bottom. Latin America's labor-intensive economies are in the wrong side of this equation, especially so at a time when the U.S. 
is abhorring from the free trade policies and agreement that paved the way for their conversion into exporters to that market. Corner between its declining possibilities of remaining competitive, competitive at the bottom and the pressures imposed upon them by its main train, trade partner for its low-cost exports, room for maneuver is a shrink. Notwithstanding the current contraction in the prices of commodities, this sector seems to have wider options. And all of such options point out to China. The TPP, India's increase in demand of commodities, and the One Belt, One Road initiative present themselves as forces of potential advance and advancement, especially the last of them. If the one belt, one road materializes, commodities will bloom again. It is obvious, nonetheless, that not only manufacturers, exporters, but commodities exporters as well will have to widen their horizons. Services, which is becoming the new export frontier, looks as the best way forward. Within the service sector, the so-called global chains of value acquire particular relevance. Until recently, many services were difficult or impossible to supply beyond the frontiers, but this has changed as a result of the exponential and ad advance in IT technologies. Thanks to them, previously domestically encapsulated services are becoming global. This is an area where Latin America could play an important role. From accountants to software, engin to software engineers, from designers to architects, from financial consultants to, researcher to researchers, the service job heading involved could be countless. However, in the same manner in which there are promising signs in the horizon, there are also threatening ones. The incoming fourth industrial revolution presents itself as the greatest challenge to the stability of the region in the next decades. And even if this is a worldwide phenomenon, the implications for Latin America can become overwhelming. The convergence and combinatorial effect of digital technology and robotics nanotechnology, biotech, in, biotech, engineering, and genomics, 3D printing, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, and energy technologies, to mention just some of the most relevant leaps, will project in, its impact in every imaginable direction. As a result, assembly lines, mining activities, farming and livestock sectors, hydrocarbon developments, service sectors can all be disrupted in dramatic ways. Especially so because the fourth industrial revolution will promote the coupling between developed and developing economies. Technologically advanced countries will become increasingly autonomous in relation to commodities, manufacturers, and services coming from the developing world. While globalization loses standing as a result of the growing autarky in developed countries, emerging economies such as those of Latin America will become immensely stressed. A huge sign of interrogation hangs thus on the future of Latin America. Only time will provide the answer. Thank you. I'm going to Latin America, they're talking about comparing the historic experience of the United States and, and Iberian America, and look, talking about the future. Um, we have about 25 minutes for a Q&A session. I invite questions from the audience, please. If you think about the emergence of the world economy from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy, to the service economy, to the information economy, and the fourth industrial revolution. The next step is the design economy, where people are looking for experience, high touch, high tech at the same time. 
And if we think about what Latin America is very good at, it's exactly the cultural aspects that you mentioned that you have distinctive and varied advantages, not only in tourism, but in music, architecture, design, style, clothing, dot, 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 food. And all these things in the next economy of the design economy will be a, a source of tremendous comparative advantage for Latin America if it can overcome two problems. One is it's, shall we say, fear of the next revolution, treating it as something to create fear rather than something that's welcomed as a great opportunity. And second, I'd like, this is probably the question part, I think the problem of governance is at the heart of this as well. The challenges of corruption that we see throughout the region, surely every country has it, but as we move toward this design economy where we need more uh, innovation and more capability at the local level, uh, governments that are constrained by corruption and abuse of power will be particularly disadvantaged. And so my questions to you are, do you think that Latin America's culture is in fact a long-term comparative advantage? And do you think that the conditions for getting that to happen will be wise government policies that are f more free from corruption than now? Well, congratulations for a very important question because you just mentioned, which I say at the end of the book, which is precisely that Latin America has a comparative advantage in this new emerging world. Precisely because, as I mentioned, Latin America being in the fringe of Western civilization and having this capability to be within and without the walls of Western civilization has been able to excel in lateral thinking, has been able to, 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 to excel in improvisational uh, capabilities. It lacks, uh, what it lacks in method and discipline, it's uh, thoroughly compensated by, by these improvisational characteristics and this uh, capacity to, to see, uh, see things in a different way. Hence, indeed, I, I agree with you. Latin America has advantage capabilities there. On the other hand, you mention a very important system. Would Latin America be prepared, institutionally prepared for what lies ahead? I'm afraid that uh, Unfortunately, one of the problems that we are facing in Latin America at this point in time is that this fourth industrial revolution is totally out of the radar, of the radar, not only of governments and decision makers, but also of scholars, intellectuals. Um, it's, it's simply nobody is talking about it, nobody is thinking about it and much has to be done. We cannot simply rely on these uh, capabilities you were referring about, but we have to emphasize resilience. We have to build resilience. And part of that building resilience passes by the elements that you just mentioned, but go, that transcends those elements as well. We need to create educational systems that promote uh, independent thinking, that promote creativeness, that promotes, uh, that stimulates uh, lateral thinking, etc., etc., instead of sim the simple accumulation of knowledge. We have to promote uh, good governance in many areas. Uh, populist uh, will have a hard time in the future because we are entering into a very difficult era in which hard truth will have to be told. And hence, there has to be a different approach to governing in Latin America that transcends the issue of corruption. When you say Latin America, you're, you're speaking as one, but you know, how homogenous it is I and mean, how much difference is there between the different countries and the societies and you know, and, and, and Have you ever been to Latin America? Uh, I've not been to Latin America. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like you said earlier in your presentation, uh, it's, it's just another 12 hours away from London, so it's, uh, it's the distance that's precluded me hitherto. But he sparked a lot of interest. So. Why didn't you buy a copy of the book? Yes, I did. Yeah. 
<laughs> you are a good candidate for buying the book. <laughs> Buy a copy of the book. And, and Speaking about Latin America right now, um, without sort of being specific and mentioning a few countries, I think it would be difficult to mention Latin America and not speak about Venezuela, and especially having the ambassador of Venezuela here at the moment. Um, you mentioned the demise of communism, um, uh, but where, where does that really stand right now, do you see, uh, in terms of Mr. Maduro, his totalitarian regime? And then I think a broader question, how do you see the economic relationships of Venezuela and other countries, for instance, here, um, Singapore, and the EU in light of the uh, recent sanctions against 47 top uh, government officials about the, um, the Treasury, the OFAC uh, sanctions that have been uh, issued, the newly issued Executive Order 13808. Um, so how do you see that influencing right now, not just Venezuela, but the region as we're here? Thank you very much. I must begin by saying that I'm no longer the Venezuelan ambassador to oh. Singapore. All right. I must add to that that I retired from my country's foreign service, hence I cannot speak in an official capacity if you sure. wanted okay. me to do so. But oh, in addition, but in addition to so that, if you want me to answer that, we will not need the 18 hours that uh, I need to answer most questions, but around three days. Okay, sure. You'll need, so you will need to take three days to answer. And I quote Ambassador Nikki Haley uh, last Monday uh, that we're dealing here with a narco state that poses a risk for the whole region, I think and that, that is Latin America. No, I think, I think that the topic today is not Venezuela. It, it is a book about understanding Latin America, so if you could reframe your question, sure. you know? I understand. Don't, so I just think, I mean, let's, uh, the question would I mean, be, you, how, how are these forces affecting the whole Latin America region? And we are seeing Venezuela being alienated, and that has a big impact. It's probably, you will know the statistics better, but it's the fourth largest, third, third or fourth largest contributor to Latin American GDP, so it's quite a, an important partner to consider when you talk about the region and, and where the trends are going forward uh, for Latin America. And I think an important topic that was mentioned before was corruption. Uh, clearly that's something that is an important point. On the positive side, <clears throat> I've been ambassador to Uruguay. I've seen the development of Uruguay in terms of agriculture and uh, how they have uh, made uh, uh, a significant transformation, and uh, at one point they, have, they were even exporting more meat than the Argentine side. We, we know uh, the potential of uh, São Paulo, Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, apart all the institutional problems and all the social uh, derivation whatsoever, they are there forever. They have a tremendous impact, and uh, in, in each cycle they can change. I've been ambassador for during through three years and a half in Chile, and I've seen the impact of uh, the, the education and the universities. On an institutional international level, I've witnessed the creation of, uh, at least of this process, of the Alianza de Pacifico, which is the most uh, one point ambitious and the most promising. I think that within the alliance, the alliance is in itself is now possibly the most uh, uh, significant vehicle of international internationalization, of integration, and from them we are all expecting some kind of uh, reading about what's going on. And when I'm speaking about reading, I'm speaking about not only within the space of Latin America towards North, but well the impact with the success or not success of TPP and uh, this uh, approaching you have. We have, we have quite detailed uh, with China. My question to you, Ambassador Alfredo, is uh, uh, there is no better vehicle than TPP. There was no more advanced uh, topic, I mean, uh, uh, again, uh, instrument, diplomatic instrument for the promoting of trade than, as you have seen, the TPP. It was, nothing is more advanced than that at this stage. It's suspended. China is uh, eventually... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the TPP so, has not been suspended. Well, uh, well, well. The, the United States, sorry, just for the record. <laughs> the, it's 11-11, okay. The United okay. States has opted out. 
okay. but the remaining 11 partners yes. met recently at a site meeting in Da Nang, Vietnam, and they decided to push ahead with this agreement. You are absolutely right, Ambassador. Okay. Nevertheless, so, my point is, can the Alliance of the Pacific play a role? How do you see the future and the relation with China? Coming to this very uh, finally point, education, 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 the role of universities, and how to create jobs. Uh, definitely, the TPP, I think, is still presents a very good alternative for Latin America if the TPP finally materializes, which I hope it will. And uh, of course, it's not only the TPP, it's also India. Uh, uh, India's trade with Latin America has been growing at 27% a year. It's replicating what China did uh, last decade. So there is a very good uh, uh, possibilities in, in relation to trade with China as well. And as I mentioned, there is also the One Belt, One Road initiative, but it's not only the Pacific Alliance, it's commodities producing countries in the region, Brazil, it's not within the Pacific Alliance, uh, Argentina is not, you just mentioned Uruguay, and those three countries, to mention many others, as Colombia, my own country, etc., will have excellent possibilities in relation with new trade with Asia. Of course, TPP is a more, it's a, it's a group, very specific group, but as for the rest, possibilities of trade with uh, Asia can be very important for commodities producing countries. Uh, and uh, I hope they become uh, ever more so. Uh, you were mentioning education, yes, indeed. That's the fundamental element within uh, being capable to overcome many of the limitations we, we are facing. And, uh, and uh, my, only, my only fear is that we are going towards a decoupling between developed and developing economies, that we are evolving into the end of globalization. If, uh, if uh, I'm lucky, that will be my next book. And, uh, and I think that uh, that's the big problem, not only for Latin America, for, but for emerging economies as a whole. I think you should uh, not forget that Asia, up to now anyway, had not been affected by this wave of uh, populism yes. that you've seen in, in America and some parts of Europe. Asians remain committed to free trade and to globalization. There's no retreat on the part of Asia. And the other good news I want to share with our Latin American friends is that the rise of China, the rise of India, and the rise of ASEAN represent the three biggest growth stories, not just of this century, but of human history. There's tremendous opportunities for all Latin American countries. We are very interested in the Pacific Alliance. Why? Because they are outward-looking, uh, outward-oriented country. But there's also good news in Mercosur with, uh, with President Temer in Brazil, Macri in Argentina. I believe that Mercosur will have a reorientation from being inward-looking, protectionist in, in sentiment to a more outward-looking group of countries. So I, I, I remain very interested, not just in Pacific Alliance, but in Mercosur. And I, I think there's tremendous opportunities in this next several decades. So time for a couple more questions. There is a booming in trade between Asia and Latin America, but there is very scarce knowledge about the regions. What is the point of NUS being one of the main schools in setting up or starting a think tank or a center for studies of Latin America? So I know that we have here all the ambassadors in the room who <laughs> support the idea, so we just want to know. It's a good idea. Um, it's not a new idea because I've had 
I've had several lunches with my Latin American <laughs> brothers and sisters, and uh, they came up with the idea, which I support. And I think that we should ask all three universities, NUS, NTU, and SMU, whether, let them compete to host a new institute <laughs> center of Latin American studies. Um, NUS has many such centers, Southeast Asian study, South Asian study, Middle East study, China, East Asia Institute. Um, NTU has, I think, an Institute of African Study. SMU had none. So my first choice would be to ask SMU, which is also very business-oriented, you know. But let's ask the three universities to compete to host a new center or institute of Latin American study. Good idea. I will bring this um, book launch or conclusion. Let me uh, once more congratulate you, Alfredo, and thank you for the wonderful lecture you gave us. Thank you I so much. You, I think I made it. <laughs> Thank you.